What is up YouTube? My name is Ben and today we are going to be breaking down RP strength, Renaissance periodization, aka Dr. Mike Isratel's video on bench press and specifically bench press for maximum muscle growth. So first off, I'd just like to start by saying that I have nothing personal against Mike. I'm going to voice a lot of disagreements here. I generally speaking have a lot of disagreements with Mike in relation to a lot of biomechanical topics, uh, specifically as it relates to uh, pec training, which is why we're covering this video. Um, and I think it's worth noting that I think Mike brings a lot of really, really, really good things to the industry as a whole. Uh, and none of what I'm about to say in any way is directly uh, targeted at him as a person or, or his character or anything like that. It's just more so about the information and uh, I think voicing disagreements about this kind of information is very, very important for moving the industry forward and I'm sure Mike would agree. So without further ado, nothing but love and respect for Dr. Mike and what he does. Again, I think he does a great job and spreads a lot of really, really good information. Uh, but I'm going to cover this video today just to kind of voice my disagreements and I'll let you all decide uh, uh, which you think, which perspective you think is a little bit more accurate or maybe just more appropriate for you specifically. So we'll jump right into it. And sort of right off the bat, um, he's probably going to go through a lot of different points here. And the first is retract scapulae, which I already take issue with. And I already, generally speaking, have heard Mike speak on this topic before. So just before we kind of get into things, very important to understand that the scaps, aka the shoulder blades, are these things that are basically managers of humeral head position. So what does that mean? Well, whenever the humerus or the upper arm is moving around in space, because it is inherently such an unstable joint, meaning it has a lot of degrees of freedom, it can kind of move wherever you want it to move in any plane you want it to move in. Um, there needs to be some degree of structural support that kind of helps the humeral head and, and allows it to move smoothly in a way that's actually structurally supported so that the joint isn't only just being held together to the body by ligament uh, and, and tendinous uh, connections, right? So we need some semblance of structural support. A great example visually of a joint that has a lot of structural support uh, is the hip, where the ball of the upper leg is really, really encapsulated or enclosed by this really convex surface of the hip capsule, aka the acetabulum. And now, you know, the hip is a very uh, stable structure because of that, but it also loses a little bit of range of motion as a product or as a consequence. So because the shoulder is very mobile, the scap, the shoulder blade needs to be able to move around with the upper arm. So we don't want to pin the shoulder blades into one single position. We actually want to allow the shoulder blades to move appropriately so that we can have proper scapulohumeral rhythm, AKA movement that's appropriate between the shoulder blade and the upper arm so that we can keep our shoulders healthy and intact and produce as much force uh, as we possibly can. So again, without further ado, let's just jump right into this. I know I've kind of said a lot, so we'll actually get to the video now. Okay, so the first tip in the bench press to hit the pecs better is to arch the back, not a ton, just a little bit works. Take your scapulae and retract them. What that does is it brings your sternal pecs into play and puts you in a real power position for the chest. And it also, by retracting the scapulae, pre-stretches the chest so that when you're down here, it's way less shoulders, way less shoulder joint. And pre-stretch pecs means your chance for muscle growth induction is just much higher. All right, so a couple of comments right off the bat. So the first commentary that I'll make is that this idea, again, that the whole retraction of scaps needs to happen, I think is a little bit of a misleading thing. I think what Mike started off by saying uh, something like arch the ch arch the back or, you know, pull the chest up, stretch the pecs, you know, pull the sternum up, I think is a really good cue for stretching some of the pecs, but you have to realize that all of the pecs stretch a little bit differently. So although the lower and lower mid portions of the chest will be more in alignment with the path of motion if you pull your chest up, the upper portions of that sternal pec or the middle pec and the upper pec especially will be pulled out of alignment if you really pull your chest up and out. So although I would recommend a little bit of an arch in the back, that's more so just to prevent any sort of excessive rounding. Uh, but again, it depends on your goal. So if you're gonna really, really have a significant arch in your back, you're gonna advantage more of the lower fibers, not more of the middle fibers, generally speaking. Obviously that can change depending on force angle. The other thing that I'll say is he made this distinction between 
more pec and more shoulder. And I just want to kind of make a clear distinction or, or rather uh, uh, clear up the confusion there, which is that the pec crosses the shoulder. So when Mike says the shoulder stress on the shoulder versus stress on the muscle, if you put any sort of stress or load on the pec, you are stressing the shoulder because the pec acts on the shoulder. The pec acts around the shoulder and moves the upper arm. So I think what Mike is really saying is joint capsule, soft tissue, connective tissue versus actual muscular tension. Uh, and I would actually argue the opposite in that if you do force your scaps to be pinned back, uh, there is a much more likely chance that uh, you'll get some kind of ligamentous based issue, some kind of connective tissue based issue uh, when you're not allowing the, the structural element of the shoulder blade to actually support the upper arm as I went through earlier. So if you're trying to pin your shoulder blade back into one position, and then you're trying to move your arm on top of that, that's a no bueno situation for the, the health of your shoulder. Much more stress will be placed specifically on the soft tissues of the shoulder when trying to limit scapular motion as opposed to the opposite. So just a sort of a, a little bit of a lifting bro science myth there to, to bust just right off the bat is this whole pinning the shoulder blades back thing is actually, although it may feel like more stress, more tension on your pecs, it's not for the reasons that we actually want, which is to actually load the muscle and allow it to do more work, not to just basically limit the, the motion of the joint from a structural standpoint so that the muscles have to make up for the lack of structural support, if that makes sense. A lot of people who bench flat backed and with their shoulders flared out, that's like the football program and high school bench press they're the ones that are like yeah man i used to bench but my shoulders got the better of me i was a competitive power lifter for years don't worry don't bother googling it i was never very strong and i benched for my entire power lifting career and other than in high school before i was a power lifter before i learned how to show track i've never one single time hurt my shoulder in the bench press ever so I think it's important to note that some people are simply less injury prone than other people. Typically speaking, the people who don't get hurt very often, often uh, use their technique as justification for why they haven't gotten hurt. And I just wanna make it very clear that there are tons and tons and tons of people that I've seen strain their pecs, uh, tear their pecs, strain muscles in their neck, all different kinds of things from specifically using this technique. And once coached to allow the shoulder blades to move a little bit more, a little bit more freely, again, to provide that structural support, all those sorts of pains went away. So kind of like an anecdotal, which do you pick? Uh, and, and to be honest, I'm gonna go with the option uh, that's more supported by the actual mechanics and the physics of the motion, as opposed to just this sort of bro science -y type thing uh, again, that, that hasn't really been looked into uh, as a mechanism for preventing injury, especially. So, how you would do this in real life is you would get down onto a bench, which I will demonstrate gladly for YouTube. First thing you do is you walk your scapulae towards your butt. This. Okay, so that's also kind of something to point out too is a lot of times when people say shoulder blades back, pin the shoulder blades back, they also say pin the shoulder blades down. Uh, but if you look at the fiber orientation of the muscles that actually pull the shoulder blades back, the motion isn't just in toward the spine, it's actually in and upward. So if you were to fully retract and squeeze your, your shoulder blades, what you would notice is there would naturally be a little bit of elevation or, or rising of the shoulders in tandem with that. And so this whole idea of like shoulder blades back and down actually doesn't make any sense at all because the back motion is directly opposed by the down motion. So this is just kind of layers on layers of things that are sort of uh, debunking this, this whole idea. So I just wanna make it clear again that like, I don't think it's anything specific to, to what Mike is saying or what he's advising. I think his experience has just been that this has been a better technique for him, which could have to do with a million different things that are completely unrelated to, to the mechanistic explanation of this. So uh, oftentimes what we see is with people who are forcing themselves to pin their shoulder blades back and down is you actually see, tend to see a lot of shoulder blade movement regardless of that because that's again your body's proper and natural solution to any sort of loaded uh, shoulder movement or not even loaded uh, just any sort of shoulder movement in general there's always a proportionate amount of shoulder blade movement to upper arm movement regardless of the activity arches your back again you don't have to crazy arch just a little bit and as you walk them back you also walk them in it's going to take a couple walks, really tuck them in there, and then 
he'll grab the bar, notice. And so notice that like almost as soon as he went to reach his arms forward, the shoulder blades actually, if you sort of rewatch and rewind this, the shoulder blades actually move a little bit forward and around. It's a little bit difficult to see in front of the bench where they should naturally be. So again, what you're seeing here is really just all spinal motion. Like when people even are consciously cueing, squeezing the shoulder blades back, pulling their chest up, it's just spinal motion, spinal extension. It's not that whole shoulder blade thing. The bar is gonna lay pretty low. If you reach up, you lose all that shit. So you should set the bar low, grab the shit. Hopefully you can get a spotter to help you. Unrack push the bar over to the position. And then sometimes, especially if you're doing higher repetitions, what you want to do is kind of tuck it again a little bit to reinforce that pattern. As the bar descends, you keep your chest stuck way in the air and you press. And way in the air and then you press. And while I'm down here, let's just knock out tip number two. So just before we kind of move on, I want you all to notice and, and just look specifically at which fibers of Mike's packs will be most advantaged in being able to push the arm up. It's basically, if you track his lower pack, his lower pack is gonna track somewhere this way, right? Which if his arms go any lower than this position shown here, is gonna be even more uh, at an advantage. And to some degree, his middle packs, right? So he's kind of moved all of his packs a little bit more in alignment with the plane of motion of the bar, but ultimately the lower pack specifically will be loaded most in this exercise, which is oftentimes why you see people, uh, especially power lifters with these massive lower packs and these upper packs that aren't uh, super developed just because they're arching the shit out of every single press that they do, right? It's, it's not the arch that's necessarily important. It's just assuming a posture that's stable enough, uh, specifically in the spine, to then actually move the arm around and, and load the arm properly for whichever division of the pack that you wanna train. Tip number two is to take a pause at the chest, especially with slow eccentric control. A pause at the chest to make sure you really milk out the unbelievable amount of tension through your stretched pecs. That will help you grow a ton. So you hear your chest is stuck out. You bring down just to around your nipple line. Pause, not caving over. Chest still big, everything stretched. This will not feel good. This pause does not feel like a rest. It feels like, holy shit, my pecs are gonna blow up and then press to a full lockout. So I do think pausing at the bottom of a bench press specifically is a very, very good idea. Uh, I think that's where all of or most of the value of the bench press comes from, given that it's a free weight exercise and it is most mechanically loaded at the bottom. Uh, a lot of people skimp out on the most difficult parts of exercises, so I, I do like to utilize pauses a lot, uh, specifically where there's the most amount of mechanical uh, torque on the individual, so uh, great point. Again, also, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that this won't be a solid pec exercise. I'm not saying that this won't be a solid delt exercise. I'm just sort of looking into the specific anatomy of, of the motion and exactly what Mike's saying and just trying to speak to the accuracy of it. Just like that. Next tip, hand position. What you want out of your hand position is for your wrists to feel good, your elbows to feel good, your shoulders to feel good, and also for you to get a nice, gnarly, deep stretch in your pecs and feel the movement in your pecs. Some people, based on their build, will have a relatively close grip, and that's how they'll feel chest the most. Some people can even do a very wide grip, and that's how they feel chest the most. Other people, if they try a wide grip, it just kind of feels like it's a ton of pain in their shoulders and nothing else is happening. So with your grip, play around to find out what's best for you. Start with just outside of shoulder width. So this is something that Mike tends to say a lot is, uh, you know, go with what's most comfortable or go with what feels good or, or go with, you know, what, what feels good and what you get the most stretch with. And I don't necessarily think those are bad bits of advice. Like I think if the majority of people are just looking to kind of get into the gym and, you know, go through their workout and not be in pain, it's like, eh, not a terrible idea. But at the same time, when we're trying to actually maximize hypertrophy and specifically maximize hypertrophy of the pecs, which is the title of the video, which is maximum muscle growth, you wanna actually create like some degree of a boundary around like, hey, these are the things that probably are more advantageous and these are the things that are probably less advantageous for pursuing the goal of greater pec hypertrophy. And 
I've talked about this about a million times now on this channel where, you know, pecs do have greater leverage when your arms are narrow toward the body and, and narrow could change depending on your specific width, meaning just what it looks like visually. So again, the 300 pound IFBB Pro, his narrow is gonna look very wide for a majority of people. On the opposite side of the spectrum, you have a, maybe an 100 pound female dancer, her narrow is gonna basically look like parallel to her torso, right? So it's really, really gonna change depending on the individual, which is the part that I sort of agree with about like, hey, this is individual specific. But at the same time, regardless of the individual, the relative narrow position and the concept of remaining narrow is the same, okay? And so this ultra wide grip stuff, this really wide out to the side stuff, I think we should just sort of delete it uh, and try to remove it from history. Uh, it's it's clearly not a very good way to press. It's not a good mechanical position to put your shoulder in for a host of different reasons that we don't really have time to get into in, in terms of this specific video, but maybe another time. Um, but again, overall, what feels good in the moment may not be something that feels good long term. So just telling people and advising people, hey, do what feels good right now is, again, not, not the best piece of advice in my opinion. Now, another thing that I would comment on is this idea, Mike keeps referring to the stretch and feel the stretch in your pecs. We don't want to really chase a ton of sensation during exercise. This is something that uh, the RP guys talk about a lot. It's like feeling a stretch in a particular muscle. and. I'll say sensation is a very valuable tool, but it's kind of the last thing on a list of things uh, in terms of the priorities that we need to look for in an exercise uh, that we should actually be, be paying much attention to, right? So if you're doing a quad exercise and you're only feeling your calves for some reason, that's probably an issue, right? But for the most part, especially with more lengthened exercises, you shouldn't really be looking to like sense the muscle, feel the muscle, connect with the muscle at all times in every inch of the range. You should more so just kind of look to control the motion and understand that the physics of the exercise selection will take care of the muscular recruitment, right? The muscular recruitment is secondary to the forces specifically that you impose on your body because all your tissues are doing are just responding to load and responding to force and your brain is ultimately going to pick the best and most efficient solution for you to do that. So you don't have to think about stretching your pecs when you're in the proper position. You just move through the range and your pecs stretch properly. Also notice that like in general, we're not like looking for sensation. We don't view sensation as this really high up valuable uh, measurement in, in real life or even in athletics. Whenever someone, you know, whenever an athlete feels something like, oh man, that feels like a very strong sensation. We're not like, oh good, great. But for some reason when we're in the weight room, all we wanna do is feel a ton of sensation. So again, we need to move away from that conversation. A lot of times, specifically in this case, if you're you know, a really wide grip bencher, a really abducted, uh, internally rotated bencher, that may be a sign if you're feeling that really, really intense stretch in your pecs, it may be a sign that your pecs are trying to be like, hey, we're holding on for dear life here, uh, please God help. Uh, and so if any of you wanna actually test this, a great way to just sort of display this mechanistically uh, in terms of like what you can create sensation with very easily in terms of like, just using poor mechanics to generate more sensation. Pin, do this right now as you're watching, pin your shoulder blade back and then squeeze the hell out of your pecs. Like pin your shoulder blade back, try to hold it there and then squeeze the hell out of your pecs. And you'll probably notice a lot of sensation when you do that. You could do it with both arms, you could do it with one arm. And then notice like if you actually squeeze your pec much more and kind of across, you may feel like a little bit more sensation, but it's not that sort of like uh, uncomfortable, sort of like uh, pinching, piercing sensation. It's a little bit different. It's a little bit more calm. So again, in the weight room, this idea of just sort of chasing the stretch, I think overall it creates more problems than it actually solves. I think we're much better off just going with the proper mechanistic explanation, the proper physics, the proper setup, and then just sort of worry about like, hey, where do I feel fatigue after the fact in retrospect, not as we're doing the exercise and as we're sort of going through the range. Grip, try one fist length out. You guys are used to fist lengths, I'm sure. So fist length is like here and here. Now we're out here. Fist length in is here, another fist length in is here, so on and so forth. Play with fist lengths at first. If one of them feels almost good, you're like, you know, this feels great. This feels a little bit worse, but this doesn't feel ideal. Play with finger lengths instead between those two. You will find a really, really good pressing point. The way you can tell again is all of your joints feel great and your pecs are getting torn to shreds at the bottom. Okay, torn to shreds, not again, not something that we're after. That's how you find hand grip 
And again, there's not one right answer. Just think about this logically for a second. Like, why would your body be uh, giving you a ton of sensation in a very specific focal place if you weren't in a significant amount of danger or you're having sex? Like, those are pretty much the only two things that your body would do that for or because of. It could be multiple answers. You can say, oh, I like the wide variant. That feels great. It also feels a different kind of great to go a little closer. No wrong answers. Just make sure you're paying attention to those cues if your joints feel good. Again, many, many, many wrong answers. Uh, if your joints feel good, that may just be a product of your current your current status. But that doesn't mean that, you know, that's going to be the same a week from now. It doesn't mean it's going to be the same a month from now. It doesn't mean it's going to be the same a year from now. And your muscles feel like they're getting really, really fucked up. What to do about elbow flare? A couple things to say about this. Some people will bench press guillotine style where they take a higher position on the chest and they let their elbows come up. They feel a huge stretch in the pecs. Their shoulders feel amazing. No problem. Correct answer. Again, correct, incorrect. Uh, should depend on the goal and not specifically the individual subjective experience with the movement. Case in point, a lot of people uh, get very, very strong on the bench press. They see tons of uh, progress in weight lifted, but not tons of progress in pecs grown or pecs stimulated. This is a very specific reason is because if you just go with what you're comfortable with in terms of, uh, you know, of course we want to be comfortable across all exercises that we're doing, but more from the standpoint of uh, if something doesn't feel totally natural to you, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad. It just might mean that it's something different. Uh, and as I'll go into, I'm sure at some point here, when we're executing a pec specific barbell press, uh, we don't we don't want to be way out wide here. And we certainly also don't want to uh, come to try to press over our face and fully lock out. But I'm sure there will be some commentary on that too. Other folks will touch a little bit below the nipple line actually on their abdomen and they will tuck their elbows on the way down. You'll see this from shirted pressing back in the day from equipped powerlifting. If that is what hits your pecs the most and it makes your elbows and shoulders feel nice and comfy and safe, beautiful, right answer. What I don't want you guys to get caught up in is people on the internet who say this is bad because biomechanics. I don't know where the fuck they say that because if you go out here, notice my pecs are getting more stretched as I pull out. Quick commentary, pecs are not getting more stretched as you go out. Uh, if anything, lower pec gets a little more stretched because just think about the two points, okay? Here's one point, here's another point. I'm moving those points farther away. But did I move this farther away from my clavicle in a way that actually stretches the muscle? No, I actually decreased the stretch from this point because I actually moved away from the ribs and now instead of sort of wrapping down and under, that upper pec is now trying to sort of come across the shoulder and through the joint as opposed to actually stretching around the rib cage and down to the arm. So no, your pecs do not stretch more as a whole. If your arm is up here, your lower pec may stretch a little bit, but not in a position that's actually mechanically advantaged. There's lots of people saying you've got to tuck in the elbows to do more chest. That's fucking backwards. If you tuck in the elbows, the line of pull aligns better with the front delts, and it's more triceps. Front delts and triceps is more like tucked. The wider you go, all the way up till here, is more pecs. However, not everyone can handle wide, and it can fuck your shoulders up. Okay, so wider grip, opposite, disagree on this point. Wider grip is less pecs. The reason why wider grip is less pecs is because Mike is looking at this from the perspective of a two-dimensional sheet of paper, stick figure, uh, sort of anatomy perspective, right? And when you look at anatomy that way and you ignore this entire perspective of the body, then you lose a very important point of view, which is the point of view that explains why the pecs will stretch more when the arm is tighter to the body because they have something to stretch around as opposed to just pulling the arm up and back. If that's not really enough to convince you from the perspective of why tighter to the body and back actually may be better, pull your arm super wide in that really abducted guillotine type position. Just try to pull your arm back. See how far back it goes, okay? Now keep your arm tight. Now pull your arm back. See how far back it goes. Would the body allow that much more range of motion if the pecs weren't stretching more? Give it a second. 
No. Right, so where the muscle stretches more is where you have more room. Coincidence? I don't think so. Set up a comfortable hand position, arch and retract. Focus on your chest. Your elbows will naturally position themselves to a point that is easy on your joints and hard on your muscles. Disagree with that. A lot of people try to naturally figure that out and it doesn't end up working well. If it takes a little bit of finagling, by all means do it. So if you do naturally and you're like, I don't know, my shoulders feel kind of mad. Try a little bit more in, just a tad. Oh, shoulders feel great. Even more in. Shoulders feel amazing, but I don't feel my chest much anymore. Boom. You so if shoulders feel amazing, but you don't feel your chest, and you also don't feel your delts, then does that mean that nothing is working? Or, I don't know. Um, again, I don't really follow that logic. You found it. That's the right answer. But if you want to flare, no problem at all. As long as you gently pause there is a very minimum risk of injury. Yes, if you're crashing down with a trillion pounds and you're not pausing and you're using sets of four or five, benching like this will fuck you up. But then benching like this will probably fuck you up too, just in a different way. Be measured, feel your body out, start with a natural elbow angle, adjust a little bit, see how it affects your shoulders, your elbows, etc. Back 10 years ago, so something that's really important to, to point out here about pressing, specifically bench pressing, but also pretty much any other activity that you can do in the gym is your body will resort to the simplest and most efficient solution depending on your aim point. Okay, so if you're doing a bench press and you stay tucked at the bottom and your aim point is to lock out over your face, right off the bat, as soon as you come out of the bottom of the motion, your elbows are gonna flare because they're going to want to end up as soon as possible where they will end up toward the lockout. Okay, if that makes sense. So for example, if I'm aiming over my face in this particular position and I come out of the bottom, instead of staying tucked and aiming over my chest where I could actually maintain that arm path, if I aim to lock out, my elbow at some point is going to have to flare, my shoulder is going to have to internally rotate. And so the body's going to do that as soon as possible so that it can start to just move in a straight line as opposed to in this sort of a abduction, adduction plane out of the bottom. So if your goal is to not let your elbows flare because you really want to train pecs the most, aim over your chest and don't lock out over your face instead of aiming, you know, just to arbitrarily lock it out and just to press willy nilly, right? So this is where some of the specific cueing and some of the specific path of motion stuff is really helpful is when you can actually determine, hey, you know, my pecs stretch here and I know that they're gonna contract all the way to somewhere here, especially if you're just talking about the middle pec. And if I know that that's the case, then I need to aim somewhere here. I'm not gonna aim up here where my delts and potentially my triceps are gonna do a little bit more work and I'm gonna end up super flared. Um, so the aim point is really, is really key here. Uh, aim for pecs over the sternum roughly, uh, aim for delts over the face roughly. When I was, geez, already on my way to getting a PhD, it was in a PhD program, I, thought there was correct technique that was basically identical for everyone. And then I fucking took one of my balls out and hit it with a hammer to punish myself because that was fucking stupid because everyone's built a little bit differently. Some people are built a lot differently. Different ratios of lower and upper arm lengths, different intracromial widths, different shapes subtly of pecs and shoulders and triceps, different slight uh, variations in design of the shoulder joint. So that if you tell people everyone should do this or everyone should do this, it's out of the gate fucking wrong. So I agree in a general sense that people are going to demonstrate individual differences that at some points can be extremely, extremely uh, different from person to person. Like the differences I've seen in some people's shoulder structure just based on x-rays and, and those kinds of things has been uh, pretty crazy. Uh, I will just say though that again, you can and it is advisable that you create a boundary around the specific kind of goal you're trying to accomplish. So if you just say willy nilly do anything, then there's there's nowhere really for people to go other than just to again, go with what feels most comfortable, which may not actually be particularly good for the specific goal that they have in mind. If you don't have a specific goal in mind, I really, really suggest that you start trying to create a goal. It could have a grain of truth. It could have a lot of truth to it, but don't just be like, oh, this is optimal, but oh, my shoulders hurt, I don't feel my chest, but this is optimal because biomechanics. Fuck all that noise. Start with the basics, play around with some variations, your body will find 
the right thing for you to do with it. By the way, don't don't fuck all that noise. Uh, it's important to pay attention to when you straw man that kind of a biomechanical argument. Uh, you just look a little silly. So, Mike, I will say that that was a little silly. So that was pretty much it for this video. Um, I think my main points of contention are really just more about the nuanced uh, biomechanics stuff, the, the mechanical stuff, specifically around the motion of the shoulder blade. And in addition, the uh, guidelines surrounding arm path for pecs. Um, I've been very, very clear about my guidelines for, for pec training in general in terms of just the narrow arm path, aiming over the chest, all those things. Uh, and I do think that there is a really, really easy way to sort of accommodate the individual when you have the general boundary. When you don't create the boundary and you just say, hey, do whatever you want, do whatever's comfortable, uh, people don't really have a good sense of like how to do that intuitively. The people who are usually able to do that pretty easily are the people who are already at a high level of advancement in, in their lifting career. So I would advise most of you to start with the mechanical principles, start with the biomechanical principles, and then make the sort of minor little adjustments that may actually end up helping you a lot along the way after that point, but start from a point that's a little bit more, uh, you know, that has a little bit more of a bedrock of foundation of knowledge. And then, at, you know, after that point, you can make the individual changes that you see fit and that may, again, make, you know, minor tweaks a little bit more comfortable for you. Um, but yeah, overall, I think it's a good video. I think that there are a lot of uh, good things that can come about from this. I especially agree on the points of just eccentric control as well as pausing at the bottom. I think those are great cues. Um, but again, just some specifics that we disagree on, which is totally fine, as I mentioned earlier. So, um, yeah, anyway, if you enjoyed this video, please give it a like, a share, a comment, whatever else, and I will see you all in the next one.